Hi there, friends. This is Pastor Rivero from Liberty Baptist Church, and I'm excited to let you know that our church is now live streaming our services. So you can check it out on mylibertybaptist.org or on YouTube. Our services are at 11 a.m. on Sunday, 5 p.m. on Sunday, and 7 p.m. on Wednesday, all Eastern time. But in the meantime, enjoy this sermon podcast here from Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Well, we are in a new series tonight. We are looking at 1 Samuel. And so what you need to do for our first message is turn to Judges. Gotcha. Yep. Judges chapter number 21 this evening. And you'll understand in just a minute why that is. Judges chapter 21 tonight. We're actually kind of in an awkward place this evening as far as where we are with the services the next few weeks. I was really desirous for us to start our series Lessons in Leadership from the book of 1 Samuel. However, of course, the next Sunday night we'll have the cantata. I'm really looking forward to that. I want to encourage you to come early to invite your friends. It's not just going to be song. It's not just going to be drama. We'll also have preaching from God's Word as well. Of course, it won't be the typical message necessarily as far as length. But at the same time, we really want to highlight the fact that you're not just coming to get a piece of musical performance and then say, isn't that great, and leave. But we want you to know that when you invite friends and family to this event, that they are coming, sure, to hear uh, music, Lord willing, well done, and drama that's done to the glory of God, but they're going to come to hear the gospel message. That's what this evening is about, and so we want you to feel comfortable knowing that when you invite your friends and family to this event, they are going to hear the gospel, and I think that the performance of the Lamb of Bethlehem, along with the reading from God's Word next Sunday night, will just go very well together, and I'm praying that there will be souls who are saved through that which happens here next week. But because of next Sunday night and then the Sunday after being Christmas Eve, and then we are getting ready for the New Year's, we're actually going to be out of the book of 1 Samuel for the next month. But I really thought it was important for us to maybe get a little bit of an introduction this evening, to maybe get our feet wet, if you will, a little bit in this book of 1 Samuel before we (laughs) depart and then really get into it in earnest in the new year. So as such, we are in Judges chapter number 21, and I'll explain why in just a few moments. Of course, I just mentioned a few moments ago that this series is called Lessons in Leadership here in 1 Samuel. And, you know, there seems to be this real emphasis in the world when it comes to leadership and training people to be leaders. Some statistics that I found just this week to go along with that was in 2019, which was the last time records were recorded in this area pre-pandemic. In 2019, according to Forbes, investments in leadership training were estimated to be $370 billion globally. Investment in leadership training, how to train leaders corporately, $370 billion, and half of that amount is actually spent in the United States. A lot of people knowing that there is a need for leadership. Leadership books are often trans... uh, trans, uh, Try that again. Leadership books are often transcendent, meaning that the most famous ones seem to just keep coming up generation after generation, whether it's Dale Carnegie's How to Make Friends and Influence People all the way back from the 1930s, or whether it's Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People in the 1990s. Uh, These books just keep coming up over and over again. And the reason why is because people are looking for an edge when it comes to this issue of leadership. There are thousands, and I'm not overestimating this, There are thousands of podcasts that are online that all deal with the issue of leadership. In fact, I would say, and this is probably not uh, an overestimate on my part, Brother Dan, but there's probably dozens just from independent Baptists trying to encourage one another of how to become leaders. Everybody's talking about leadership. Everybody is studying about leadership. People are looking for leaders. But yet, as we look around at the leaders we have, and I'm not just talking about politics tonight, I'm, look, I'm talking about our culture, our nation, this world. As we look around, as much as there's this great insatiable desire to train leaders and to find leaders, there's a great lack of leaders. As much as there's this desire to train leaders 
and to identify leaders, there is a great lack of leadership in this world. And as we come to 1 Samuel, Israel is in a vacuum of leadership. And it's interesting tonight that in this vacuum of leadership, it's not a leader that starts writing the ship. It's not a leader who starts the process of writing the ship. It's actually a follower. It's actually a servant. And tonight as we look at this, I want us to understand this tonight. If you get one thing from what we're preaching this evening, it would be this. The gateway to leadership is always service. The gateway to leadership is always service. Now, many of you remain seated tonight because we're in Judges chapter 21 and we're in verse number 25. And I, I, boy, I feel bad making you stand up for a sentence. Should I do it? No, I'm just kidding. I won't do it. Why is it important that we start here? This gives us a little bit of the issue of where we are when 1 Samuel begins. It says this, In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you remember that? We left Judges months ago, and it was a bitter taste, wasn't it? Do we need to talk about how Israel had descended into absolutely worldly chaos at the end of the book of Judges? They were unrecognizable as God's people, and they did that which those people of the land did, and even worse. And it says at the end of the book, and in those days there was no king, there was no leadership in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And we had a respite with the book of Ruth, didn't we? We had that wonderful breath of fresh air as we studied the book of Ruth. But at the same time, we have to come back to the timeline where we left off when we ended the book of Judges because in the timeline, Ruth fits inside, as we've talked about before, inside of the book of Judges. But where the book of Judges ends, 1 Samuel begins. And so as we look at 1 Samuel, as we're about to study 1 Samuel, we understand that it's happening within the context of Israel being a place where there is no leadership and Israel being a place where God is not honored, glorified, and if he is worshipped, it's only done in a token manner. If he is worshipped, it's only done in a way to check a box, to fulfill an obligation, but there's very little heart for God in the people of Israel. How do we know that? Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter number 3, which is our companion passage tonight and does fulfill my contractual obligation to actually read out of 1 Samuel if we're preaching out of 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter number 3, look at verse number 1. Because I do believe that these two texts actually link together. And reading 1 Samuel chapter 3, the first three verses, is much more instructive for us after reading what we just did out of the book of Judges. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1. It says, And the child Samuel, well, we'll talk about him later, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Eli was the high priest. Look at this next sentence. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Well, as we look at this text this evening, and as we look at what we just read in Judges, but also what we see here in 1 Samuel, we realize that Israel is in a very desperate situation. You know, as we're about to study 1 Samuel, it's probably important for us to give a little bit of a summary of the book and to give us a little bit more of an understanding of what 1 Samuel is all about. You know, 1 Samuel is a book of transitions. In many ways, while it is a book of leadership, it is a book of of transitions. Israel is going to transition from leadership by judge to leadership through king. You know, in the book of 1 Samuel, we'll find Samuel being the last judge will then have the nation transition from leadership by the judges to leadership of kings, and that will remain that way for several hundred years. It's a book of transition from theocracy to monarchy. From theocracy to monarchy. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by theocracy? I mean that Israel was unique in the sense that God was king. God was their king. He laid down the law. The judges simply interpreted God's law and then applied it amongst the people. But we're going to find that Israel is not just going to symbolically change from judges 
to kings, but they're going to change their very form of government from a theocracy where God is king to a monarchy where man is king, and we'll see a big difference. It's a book of transitions between its first king, Saul, and its second king, David. And you want to talk about difficult transitions between one leadership and another? Well, let's look at Saul, who didn't want to give up the throne, and David, who had been anointed to be king, and then Saul trying to hunt down David like an animal for maybe a dozen years. But it's a book of transitions. The book of 1 Samuel covers roughly a 100-year period from roughly around 1100 B.C. to around 1000 B.C. That period covers the story of Samuel's birth until the death of Saul. And speaking of them, there are really three main characters in this book. Of course, I always want to be careful when I say the word character that you understand that I'm talking about real people who are found in this book. That this is not a fictional account, nor is it a fictional story. But when we talk of these men who we're going to talk as and mention as leaders of Israel, these are real men. The first being Samuel. He was the last judge. He'll be notable for being both prophet, priest, and judge. And in many of the characteristics of Samuel, we'll also find some characteristics of Christ. Sometimes you'll call a man like Samuel a type of Christ. That does not mean that he was Jesus Christ or he was like the angel of the Lord that sometimes we see appear in theophanies in the Old Testament. But we see many of the characteristics of Christ in Samuel as prophet, priest, and judge. And Jesus, we can look at as both prophet, priest, and king. He's the first character. And of course, the book being named after him as well. Uh, the second is Saul. And Saul was the first king. In 1 Samuel, we'll watch his transformation from humble origins into a murderous tyrant. He's going to start very humbly. In fact, his story of following God, and I can't wait to get here later on, just looking for some donkeys. And by the time his donkey hunt is over, he finds out that he's going to become the next king of Israel. It's a very unique story. And he's humble. In fact, so much at the beginning, at his coronation, he hid and didn't want to be presented in front of the king, in front of the people of Israel. But yet by the end of the book, we find him, spoiler alert, dead. And he's dead because of his own sinful rebellion against God. He's the second character. The third character is David. I love David. I don't know about you. One of my favorite characters in all of the word of God. His heart and his passion for God. We see him when he was anointed by Samuel. Remember, all of his brothers were presented before Samuel. David was the afterthought. Jesse didn't even think of bringing David before Samuel. He needed him to watch the sheep. But God impressed upon Samuel's heart that none of these brothers were the man. And he said, isn't there anyone else? And they said, well, I mean, there's David, but who cares about him? And Samuel says, hey, we're not doing anything else till you fetch him. And I see him. And the next thing you know, he's anointed as the heir apparent to Saul. We see him at David and Goliath. The story that every child knows and that we all heard in Sunday school, perhaps even if you didn't go to a Bible teaching or preaching church growing up. The story of David and Goliath is something that everyone knows and references whether seemingly they know the Lord or not. But we're going to find this David and his growth from shepherd into the sweet psalmist of Israel, and then into its next king. So we're going to see these three characters, and we're going to see their leadership qualities, and we're going to see the way they present themselves before Israel, and we're going to see them good, bad, and ugly. And I mean it in every sense of the word. We're going to see them at their best, we'll see them at their worst, and we're going to see them in places where you just kind of hold your hand, head, hands into your head and say, what on earth is going on here? We'll see it all, and we'll learn lessons of leadership through the entire book. But our verses tonight are important as well. It's important that we looked at the verses that we do tonight, even in our introduction to this message. Judges 21, 25, we've talked about very much before. There was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Listen, it's a dangerous thing when everyone does what they feel is right. It's a dangerous thing when everyone does what they feel is right. Some people would say true freedom is when everyone can do whatever they want to do. Could I remind you tonight that that's not freedom? That's a recipe for chaos. When everybody can do that which they want to do, 
Things don't get better, they get worse. Do you know how I know that? Uh, because I've driven into Boston before and every man does that which is right in his own eyes and the traffic doesn't get better, it gets worse. Well, everybody does what they want. Nobody gets pulled over. What happens? Well, everyone just drives in straight lines and everyone uses uh, their, their turning signal and nobody honks. It's chaos. I was driving to Logan yesterday, and of course, it's Saturday. Nobody's going to be driving on Saturday. It's going to be in and out. No, no. Everybody lost their collective minds yesterday. And you know how I know that? Because people were driving in Boston on a day that ends with day. Some of you catch that later, all right? But that's just the way it is. It's chaos because every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You know, true freedom is not doing what you want to do. True freedom is living under the leadership of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again because it's important. True, uh, 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 true freedom is not living the way you want to live, but true freedom is living under the leadership of Jesus Christ. Why? Because when He directs our paths, we know that we're going to go in places uh, that will be beneficial for us and that glorify Him and are safe for us. And we realize that even if He guides us into the midst of the storm, that He's going to be there with us. And friend, that's what true freedom is. But that's not what happens here in Judges. But then we get to 1 Samuel chapter number 3 this evening, and we see that it says there's this boy Samuel, this child. I believe he's a young teenager at this point. We can quibble about the exact date. I believe that the way God speaks to him, and we'll look at this later, he speaks to him not as if he's a four or five-year-old. It seems that he's a young man who has more of an understanding of who God is, even though he's not fully been taught about the Lord, even though he lives in the temple. But as we look at verse number 1, we see this. How desperate is the situation in Israel? It says, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. We use the word precious today as something that we hold dear and in high regard. When we say something's precious today, we say it's something that's close to us. If you have some precious jewelry, what do you do? You put it in a box. You keep it safe. You know why? Because it's something you hold in high esteem. It's something that has great value. You might have some precious memories. Those are some things you hold tight. Maybe you have pictures. Maybe you have mementos, something like that. You want to make sure you don't forget those memories. And so you hold on to a ticket stub. You hold on to a trinket. You hold on to a photograph. Remember when we used to print those? I remember when we had these things called albums. And you had to turn the pages just to be able to see all the photos instead of having one million of them on your phone. I kind of miss those days, to be quite honest with you, to be able to have them and to be able to look at them in that, in that, in that very uh, tactile way. But they're precious memories. But when that word precious is used here in 1 Samuel 3, verse number 1, it doesn't mean that they held the word of God in high regard. Can I be honest with you? Their issue was exactly the opposite. They had no desire to listen to God. In fact, they had been ignoring God for some time. And so when it says that the word of God was precious in those days, that word there means that it was scarce. It was scarce. You say, well, pastor, how could you possibly know that? This King James Bible, I mean, I can't understand anything about it. Well, we just keep reading. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be weird about this. I'm just saying the context is right there in the verse. And if we continue to read it, we understand exactly what it means. The word of God was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So that doesn't mean they held it in high regard. It means this, God had ceased speaking to them in the way that he had in times past. You say, well, well, when do we ever see anything like that? Well, we talked about it last Sunday morning when God was silent for 400 years. Why? Because the end of the book of Malachi, all the people could do was ask God questions and question his fairness and question what he was doing and question whether he even loved the people of God or not. And so what he said was this, this is what I want you to do. Follow the law of Moses. This is what I want you to do. Look ahead to the Messiah. But in the meantime, I'm not saying anything because no one's really listening. And for 400 years, that's exactly what happened. For 400 years in the time of that intertestament period, between Old and New Testament, one little page in your Bible, and 400 years, the Word of God was precious. There was no open vision. You know, many times when people stop listening, God grows silent in an effort to have the silence deafen the ears. We talked about that last week, didn't we? 
that sometimes when that silence is there after a while, you say, well, what's going on? Have you been in a store before where they have that Muzak? You know, they're playing that kind of music in the background where it's it just, it's, it's nothing. It's just there to cover up I, I don't know what. And some of it is actually there to try to encourage you to buy psychologically. That's, that's true. I mean, we worked at a jewelry store. We had a Muzak machine. And the music that, was, that they played constantly was to try to help you spend money on jewelry. And to be honest with you, when I was on the floor, people didn't spend enough. At least for the commission that I needed to pay my school bill. But other than that, we did the best that we could. But, uh, but, but, there's, but have you ever been in a place like that and then maybe the music cuts off and you don't notice it for a few minutes? But then after a while you say, well, it's quiet in here. And, and you notice it. And the point of God being silent was for someone to notice, hey, something different going on here. Wasn't God talking to us before? And now he's not. To try to get someone's attention. That's what we see in verse number one. In verse number two, we see that it says that Eli, who was the high priest and the judge at that time, he would be the second to the last high priest and the second to last judge. It says Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. You know, if we were to look in the verses before, we'll find out that Eli is now an elderly man. He has been in this position for some time. And the Bible says that he's having difficulty seeing. I would submit to you tonight that that is not just a physical condition for Eli, but it's also a spiritual one. When we look at later how he interacts with his two sons who were doing wicked and lewd things within the very tabernacle of God, and he gave them a collective slap on the wrist. No, I, I'm being careful what I say tonight because of the ears that are here tonight, but understand they did wickedly and abominably within the tabernacle. And Eli says, guys, you know, you really shouldn't do that. And his eyes grew dim. Not just physically, but spiritually. How much so? I believe it says in verse number three, And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. You know, this phrase is a descriptive way to say that it was nighttime. Uh, the lamps were supposed to be lit during the day, but they were not necessarily to be kept up at night. Exodus 27, 21 says, In the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. And so what we find is, though, this is a descriptive way of saying, well, everyone's about to go to sleep. But I would also submit to you once again, while this is a accurate representation of what's happening, at the same time, we could look at the spiritual connotation of this and say this, Israel's been lulled to sleep. Eli can't see. Israel's asleep. Nobody understands what God's doing. He's not speaking. And every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. And that's where we begin in 1 Samuel. And that's where we start in this book. It's a dark time for Israel. And it's natural to think that the catalyst to change the nation is a leader. You know what Israel needs here? A strong leader. It needs someone to grab the bull by the horns. And once that strong leader gets in there, Israel will change. Yet that's not what happens here. In fact, you'll see that in a nation of lackluster leaders, it took someone that was a follower to make a difference. In a nation of lackluster leaders, it took a servant to make the difference. Will you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1? We're going to read this section. Now, we'll go back and preach on it later on. So I do want you to understand this now, but we'll look at it more later on. It says this, Now, there was a certain man of Ramoth Amzophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephratite. And he had two wives. There's the first problem. Yeah. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. And the name of the other, Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. By the way, Hannah's name means favor or grace. Uh, Penaniah's name means pearl. Now, that might seem odd when we find out her exact uh, countenance here, particularly towards Hannah. But I would say pearl is probably a great name for her. It's very fitting uh, because just like a pearl at the core, she was an irritant. 
you know, every pearl grows because of an irritant that's inside. Uh, that's what Penaniah was. <laughs> You say, well, why would you say that? Well, verse 3, And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of the hosts of Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penaniah his wife and to all her sons and daughters portions. So he's giving of the sacrifice that they're to offer. But to Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Do you see a problem here? Of course, certainly. Uh, this issue of not being able to have a child would have been something, we've covered this before, something that would have been a great burden for her, particularly in that time when you were not able to perpetuate the line of your family. And for her to feel like, like maybe she was even cursed of God because she could not have this male child particularly. And here we go, verse 6, And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when he went up, when she went up and the house of the Lord, and she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. And that's not talking about her spiritually fasting. That just means she was so agitated in her spirit, she couldn't even eat. She's hurting. This is a difficult situation for her in her life. It says, then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Guys, let's talk for a second. We can say some things that are, could we put it this way, outside the box a little bit. This is one of the worst questions any husband has ever asked a wife in the Bible. First of all, he's married two women. And he says, look, hey, hey, babe, what's the big deal? I mean, I'm better than 10 sons, right? Now, I filled this in in my Bible. I'm not saying I'm changing the Bible, but I put in big letters right next to it, No! <laughs> You're not. Why would you say that? Why would you ask that? Why would you think that? What's the matter with you? And you say, oh, You're just trying to be funny. Well, yes, I am. But there's a serious part about this. As this woman, Hannah, has been beaten down. No, her husband doesn't respect her on multiple levels, her quote-unquote sister wife, if you will, is an irritant to her. She can't even eat, and she feels like God's forsaken her. This is how we open the book of 1 Samuel. It's almost as if, well, if Judges wasn't bleak enough, let's just jump right into this. But this is where Israel was. By the way, this is what happens when everyone does whatever they want. This is a result of what happens when everyone does whatever they want. When whatever you think as a family constitutes a family. Whatever you think a grouping should be. No, no, when you don't listen to what God says about matters of home and family and decency and country, when you don't listen to these things, this is what you get right here. You get a mess. But saying that, it says this, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat on the seat by a post of the temple for the Lord of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall be no razor come upon his head. There'll be a Nazarite vow. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord and Eli marked her mouth. Eli's watching this woman that she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. Now, we sometimes have public prayer here, or sometimes you come before the altar or whatnot, and we have all seen someone at times or seasons, or maybe you'll be able to say the same thing with yourself, where you're praying to the Lord and your lips are moving, but no sounds coming out. You know why? Because your prayer is not being framed for us to hear. Your prayer is being framed for the Lord and the Lord only. But your lips are moving. If I saw someone praying in that manner, it would never cross my mind, you know what? <laughs> She's been drinking. It would never even cross my mind. Do you know why? Because I'm used to seeing people pray. No, I'm used to seeing people pray. 
Here's a man whose eyes were dim. Here's a culture where people have gone to sleep. Here's a nation where everyone does that which is right in his own eyes. And there's a woman who's in sorrowful heart. There's a woman whose husband's not treating her right. There's a woman who has another woman in her life that's not treating her right. Uh, there's a woman uh, who feels like God perhaps is not treating her right in her life. And she's pouring out her soul to the Lord. And here's Eli, the very high priest of Israel. And he's saying, I've never seen anyone pray like this. I just guess she's drunk. How bad have they gotten as a nation? No, no, we wouldn't say that because we see people pray. We know people pray. But this man is so outside of what is the norm or should be the norm of faith in God. He says, I mean, the only thing that makes sense here is, is this woman is just gone. And what does she say? Verse 14 actually, Eli in verse 14 said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunk and put away thy wine from thee? And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful heart. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy hand made for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Oh, uh, oh uh, 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 go, go, go in peace. I added that in, but I have to imagine that's probably him trying to redirect from uh, accusing her of what she was doing. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat. And her countenance was no more sad. By the way, this isn't my message. But did she know that she was going to get her request? But her countenance was no more sad. You know why? Because she poured her heart out to the Lord. And she left it on the altar. No, we're not going to go deeper there tonight. I just want to make mention to you. Well, you know, I'll be happy when the Lord gives me my request. No, no, we should just be pleased when God's willing to hear our request. And we leave it at the altar and leave it to the Lord. She was able to leave. She was able to eat. She was able to rejoice in her countenance because she knew the God of heaven heard her. And it says in verse number 19, they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to the house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him, of the Lord. The name Samuel literally means for the Lord. Samuel, this boy that came from the Lord, will be given back to the Lord. And we're going to find out as time goes on, as I just mentioned, that it's going to be Samuel that will help start the process of lifting Israel out of its spiritual wandering and put it back on a right footing once again. So you say, so pastor, it's Samuel, the great leader, was the one who changed the trajectory of Israel. What do you think we've been reading the last 10 minutes? It wasn't Samuel. It was a woman that nobody was paying attention to. It was a woman that everyone had counted out. It was a woman that nobody was even paying attention to. And those who were paying attention to her were putting uh, to her... Uh, were, were uh, looking at her in ways that weren't even true. But yet, God used a servant. Go back to verse number 11, if you will. It says this, And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, and I will give unto him the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. What jumped out at me in studying this even just a few days ago, that in verse number 11, that word handmaid is used three times in one sentence of prayer. The handmaid, the handmaid, the handmaid. That word handmaid in Hebrew is the word ama, which literally means this, a maid servant. I'm your servant. I'm your servant. I'm your servant. And it was this woman that was willing to not be a leader, but to be a servant that changed the course of Israel's history. But you know, this is always true. This has always been the case that God uses servants 
to do the job that oftentimes leaders aren't able to do themselves. Who was the one that saved Israel in the midst of Jacob and all of his difficulties? It was Joseph, who was a servant in Potiphar's house and a servant in the prison, and then became a servant of Pharaoh. And by the end of the book, when his brothers are afraid, when Jacob passes off the scene that Joseph is going to get his retribution, he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He became a leader, but he started as a servant. Elisha was serving his family. Elisha was just out there with a yoke of oxen, several. And he's plowing, he's just doing his work, and Elijah just drops a mantle by him. And you know what he did for years? Elisha served Elijah. In fact, it was said right before Elijah was taken in that whirlwind into heaven about that relationship between the servant, Elisha, and Elijah. It was mentioned. What about, uh, what about Joshua? Joshua was called the servant of Moses. And Joshua is one of the most underrated and unheralded characters in all the Word of God. He did what Moses was unable to do, to bring the people of Israel across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. Nehemiah certainly must have taken a leadership course. He's a man with a burden. He was the cupbearer of the king. Why is your countenance so sad? That scared him. Because if you were sad in front of the king, yeah, they put you in front of the king so you could be happy. And he wasn't happy. But he was honest. And God used a servant to become governor of Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls that they hadn't, they were barely able to rebuild the temple, let alone the walls. The gateway to leadership has always been service. The gateway to leadership has always been service. No, 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 God's not just looking for a few good men to be leaders. No, no, what God is looking for is a few men and a few women who are willing to serve tables. What God is looking for is a few men and a few women who are willing to say, my name doesn't have to be in lights. I don't have to be in a magazine. I don't need to be recognized in the church bulletin. I don't have to have my Facebook uh, picture on the church website. I don't have to have any of those things. You know what I need to do? Uh, I don't need to be in charge of anything necessarily. I just need to be a servant. That's who God's looking for. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 says this, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, Paul said, that I might gain the more. Paul! So you know what I need to do if I want to win more people to Christ? I got to be a servant. Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. No, he says, I'm not trying to please men because I need to serve Christ. Paul, Peter, and James, at the beginning of their epistles, always identify themselves in this way as the servant of God. The servant of God. I've heard pastors that love to announce themselves as the man of God. The M-O-G. The man of God's in the house. Can I be honest with you? That's a, that's a silly thing. The man of God in the word of God never had to call himself the man of God. When the men of God were inspired by God to identify themselves, they identified themselves as servants. They said, we are servants. He said, but that doesn't make sense because they were leaders. Yes, and they were leaders for God because they were servants. By the way, God will take leaders and elevate them out of the ranks of servants. But no matter how high up the quote unquote chain you are, you are never high enough to not be a servant. And Hannah's the perfect example. In the midst of personal difficulty, and in the midst of her life, not going the way she thought it would go, she said this, Lord, at my very best, I am your handmaid. Use me however you want to be used. And Eli was nothing in the spiritual economy of Israel. 
Hophni and Phinehas were less than nothing in the spiritual economy of Israel. Elkanah was just there and was not a difference maker in the life of Israel. It was this woman that was willing to be a servant that God used to change the entire course of the nation of Israel. God uses servants as leaders, but problems arise when leaders forget that they're servants. God uses servants as leaders, but problems arise when leaders forget they're really just servants. Saul is going to become king, but there's going to become a problem. He likes being king. He likes calling the shots. And when Samuel tells him, I need you to hold on a bit, and I'm going to come to town and I'm going to take care of things, he says, well, I have my own reasons for doing what I should do, and so I'm just going to kind of ignore what Samuel says. And Samuel says this in 1 Samuel 15, 17 to Saul, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? He said this, When thou wast little in your own sight. When did Saul get in trouble? When he forgot he was a servant. And he thought everyone was there to serve him. David. David did really well in a lot of ways. But when did he get in trouble with Bathsheba? When he saw himself as someone he wasn't. In fact, when the prophet Nathan came to him, and we mentioned a little bit of this this morning, there's a little bit of overlap between what we've been talking about in Sunday school. He's given that parable of the rich man and the poor man. David is the rich man in that parable, fleecing the flock of the poor man. What, what does that mean? that he was rich in his own eyes instead of the one that was poor in spirit. I seem to remember later on, someone said, blessed is the poor in spirit. Because that's the posture of a servant. You know, we don't need a church of leaders. We need a church of servants. And as time goes on, God calls some servants to lead. But as they lead, they're still required to be servants. Well, that sounds kind of like, uh, like what are you trying to say? No, no. To be a leader, you have to be a servant. Mm -hmm. And once you are a leader, you must remain a servant. Or else you'll get your mind in a place it not, ought not be. And you'll think you're someone that you're not. you think you're something that you're not. And God has a way of reminding leaders that they really are just servants. Could I put it this way maybe rather inartfully? But God has a way of knocking us down a peg when we need it. And at the time we don't want to serve is oftentimes the very time God wants to use us and to lead us and to turn us into the leaders we ought to be, even when it's in an inconvenient season. I'll give you this story and I'll be almost done. About this time last year we went to Heartland and we were there for a few days and for, for various reasons and, and we were there and we were asked, I was asked to preach the final chapel of the semester. Now most of the time the final chapter of the semester is a prayer service. They just put a bunch of prayer requests in front of everyone and they uh, asked them to pray. And they just did that a few days ago and it was really an important time. There's a young man who lost his, his father. His mother's paralyzed from an accident. It's a very difficult thing. And so having this prayer service is a really good way to be able to end the semester. And Brother Copes, who many of you know, said, uh, Brother Adam, I feel really impressed of the Lord to ask you to preach the final chapel. There was nothing in me that wanted to preach for a host of reasons. I had no desire to preach the chapel. I had, I had nothing with me. I only had a message that I would preached here right before I had left um, about uh, called the Thanksgiving time machine because that's homiletically sound. But no, it, it, I mean, biblically correct. I, I mean, I stand by it, but I'm just saying it, it's just kind of a strange thing to be able to bring in and preach, and especially because it was, well, after Thanksgiving. But I prayed on it, and we talked about it, and said, you know, I feel like I need to do this. And I get this. I don't want to do this. I have no desire. I, I'm not asking to do this. But Lord, you've put this in my path. I prayed over it. I think I need to do it. 
Later on that day, we were sitting in the office of Brother Jamie and Miss Vicki Jett. And we we're getting ready to meet with them. And they said, well, we need just a minute. This is, we're meeting with this young lady. And there was a young lady that was there that was, it was obviously very distressed. Very, there was something that was on her heart. And she left, and she's kind of wiping her eyes, and, and she walked out and kind of nodded at me and, and moved out. And I thought it was a little strange, but I, we, we went in, and, he, and Brother Jett, who was, um, was the dean of men there for many years, Mrs. Jett, the dean of women, and now just teaching the college. And they've been to our church before and preached. He's preached here before. Brother Jett says, uh, Brother Adam, you, you probably need to know this, but uh, that young lady had just a week ago had said she's not coming back to Bible college in the spring. She quit. In fact, she hadn't done some of her work, and she, she said she was done. There were some home issues that were very difficult. Uh, she just came in here, and she says, Brother Jet, what do I have to do to finish out my classes so I can pass them so I can come back next year? And I realized in that moment that God used me, that God used us to be able to minister to this young lady where if things had not transpired in the way that they had, that that service wouldn't have happened. I wouldn't have preached, and she may not have made the decision that she made. Now, before you get a little, you know, boy, boy, pastor, you know, I mean, well, let's just pat yourself on the back. Hey, you did good, pastor. We're proud of you. We'll line up and shake your hand after church. You're good. That, that's not the point. The point is, I didn't want to do it. I had no desire to do it. But what I decided to do was this, is if I'm asked to serve, if the Lord's in it, then my own comfort, comfort, my own preference, my own desire takes a back seat to what God is doing. And because of what the Lord did that day, no, no, listen, well, because of what the Lord did that day. Because I could have got up there and said opposite of what the Lord wanted me to say. And really, any, anything that I say that is of any value comes from God anyway. It's sure not from me. It comes from this book. Not from anything that I have that's of great value of my, of my own personal uh, witticisms or thoughts or anything like that. But because I was able to put myself out of the equation and just be a servant, there's a young lady whose life changed. Man, you know what that makes me want to do? Serve more makes me want to serve more. Oh, boy, I bet, you, I bet it makes you love pastoring more. Boy, I bet it makes you get up there and preach. You preach the word. That's the way you want to be, pastor. That's the way. Get, be a VIP. Boy, you want to be out there, get in the magazines and get in those big meetings and you preach, 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 preach. That's what you want to do. You know what it really wants me to do? Just serve. Despite what my own personal thoughts may be, my own hardships, my own difficulties, you know who did that? I seem to remember last night from Philippians chapter 2. There was one who condescended to a level that we can't even imagine. Our human brains can't even imagine the level of condescension. It was so good how Brother Dan said this last night. By the way, if you missed it, I mean, it, it was excellent. It, it was, you know, oh, isn't it, isn't it so, it's such a bad thing? He, was, he condescended to be born in a stable. He condescended to be put to this flesh in his incarnation. I'm not trying to be weird how I say this, but, but forget the stable, forget the manger. The fact that he robed himself with this flesh boggles the mind and took upon him the form of leadership. Took upon him the form of a servant. If Jesus looked at himself and was willing to be called a servant, if Jesus looked at his disciples when they were all arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And he says, while you're doing that, let me put a towel around me. And I'm going to do one of the most humbling and humiliating jobs that a person could do, is wash people's feet. If he could do that, who are you to say that you're above servanthood? And who am I to say that leadership is where it's at? No, no, no. The gateway to leadership has always been and will always be service. 
Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in his word.